All right, let's finish this up. Integrating using substitution continued. So this is 5.5 in our Stewart text. Um, remember, keep in mind, this process only works if we're reversing the chain row. So we have to have an integrand that has the form. We have a function inside of another function. And the derivative of the inside function appears as a factor in the integrand. And in turn, we can integrate just f of u with respect to u, where u is equivalent to the inside function. So only if we have something that stems from a, a chain row can we use substitution. All right, that being said, let's continue right along. All right, cosine of x e to the negative sine of x. Now notice the cosine here is kind of just as a, as a, as a factor of the integrand, it's all by itself, but the negative sine of x is up inside that power of e. So my instinct is to let u be the negative sine x, then du would be, well, the derivative of the sine x is the cosine of x. So the derivative of the negative sine x would be negative cosine x, and don't forget to throw on the differential. But if you notice here, we're gonna replace this with u, then all we have left is the cosine of x dx. We have this extra negative sign here, so we're going to multiply both sides by negative one, and we're going to say negative du is the cosine of x dx. So thus when we integrate the cosine of x e to the negative sine x dx, and again I'm going to stop writing this shortly, um, I'm going to just put the cosine of x next to the dx so we can maybe see more clear if you're still not seeing it quite clearly. So the cosine x dx is going to get replaced with negative 1 times du, it's not minus du, it's negative 1 times du. And I'm going to call this u. So this is equivalent to integrating e to the u times negative du. But we're always going to take those extra coefficients or constants that are factors and we're going to bring them out front. So this is negative e to the u du. And we can integrate e to the u really simply. Don't forget the derivative of e to the u with respect to u is e to the u, and the antiderivative of e to the u with respect to u with nothing fancy going on is just e to the u with that negative out front. So therefore, my answer, the integral of the cosine of x, e to the negative sine x, dx is equal to negative e, and we're gonna replace everything, every u with negative sine x, plus c. And again, feel free to check this by taking the derivative. Oh boy, I'm all on the page this time. Okay. All right, so these come with lots of practice. So we have to start thinking of things and remembering the derivatives of our trig functions. The power functions are pretty self-explanatory. Derivatives of trig functions, derivative of log functions, so forth and so on. All right, so I see the tangent squared of x here. I see the secant squared. Um, let's see, so I have the tangent. So remember, what's the derivative of the tangent? And what's the derivative? of the secant, because I can replace the tangent with u and I'd have u squared, um, or I could replace the tangent with the secant and have the u squared over here. Well, the derivative of the tangent is, oh, interesting. Here's the tangent inside a squared function and there's its derivative. The secant would be the secant tangent, let me see, secant of x, tangent of x, right? The derivative of the secant is a secant tangent. Does that help me? So if I let this be u, so let me see if I break this up, right? So let me see. This is just the tangent of x, the tangent of x, the secant of x, the secant of x, right? That's what this means. Now, if I let u be the tangent, let's see how this would work. If, if I let u be the tangent of x, then I would have u, u, 
right, u times u, and then this would be secant squared, so this would just be du, so that would work nice. But if I let u equal the secant of x, then the derivative would be the secant tangent, so we would have, this would be extra because we would have, the derivative would be secant and the tangent, so we would have a du and a u, but then we would have the tangent of x floating around with nothing to replace it. So this is the route we're going to go. So I'm going to go back, I'm gonna write this over, if this is, I'm gonna treat it like this, the tangent of x squared, secant squared x dx, let's let u equal the tangent of x because du is the secant squared x dx and that falls into place nicely. So this is equivalent to integrating u squared and then secant squared x dx is just du. Whereas if we tried to let u be the secant, then we would have an extra tangent floating around. And I'm not quite sure what we would do with it. We couldn't do anything with it. So this is actually the route we have to go. So the integral of u squared du is 1 third u cubed plus c. So there, we got it all done. Now we have to just replace it, go back in, and we say our original problem, tangent squared of x, secant squared of x dx is one third u, which was, we let that be the tangent of x, cubed plus c. We typically don't write tangent uh, trig functions to powers this way. We can write it like this. Either way is perfectly correct. You can take the derivative. I guarantee you if you take the derivative of this, it's going to give you our integrand. So hopefully I'm providing you with enough examples. Every example is different. Every example has its little um, twerks. So you're just going to have to practice. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to go through the problems with you together. The more you do, the better you are going to get at this. All right, so natural log of x and one over x. So reminder, the trick here is to remember the derivative of the natural log of x. Well, the derivative of the natural log of x is one over x. So I'm gonna rewrite this problem as the natural log of x times one over x dx. Aren't those equivalent? And why did I do that? Because now I'm going to let u equal the natural log of x. Then things fall very nicely into place. The derivative of u is one over x dx, which is right here. So therefore, I'm really integrating just u du. Super simple integral. The antiderivative of u is one half u squared plus c. So therefore, the antiderivative of the natural log of x over x is one half the natural log of x squared plus c. Now be careful, this isn't a trig function, so we always write the natural log inside the parentheses. Oh my gosh, sorry, I got all crooked on you again. Here we go. The natural log we write inside the parentheses with a power, we don't put the power next to the ln, we just don't do it. All right, let's revisit um, the, why the antiderivative of one over x, why we have to throw in those absolute values, especially if you're moving on to calc two, it's really, really super, super important. Um, there is a difference. All right, why is? So up until this point, um, we have just sort of ignored the fact that we have to include those absolute values. Um, well, why? Because if we don't include those absolute values, then we could potentially have a problem. Uh, remember what this is. When we are integrating, if we look at the function one over x, so one over x looks like this, right? And it also appears its second piece is over here in this quadrant. So if we were just simply looking to find the area between one and two under this curve, then we wouldn't have to worry about these absolute values. We would say that the area under one over x dx from one to two 
is just the natural log of x evaluated between 1 and 2. Now here, if this is not improper to not put the absolute values on because we're only looking between 1 and 2. All the values between 1 and 2, including 1 and 2, are positive. So I don't have to worry about putting the absolute values in. So now I stick in my upper limit of integration, which is the natural log of 2 minus the lower limit stuck in there, the natural log of 1. Now this is just 0. So this is the natural log of 2. So here, um, this area right here, this little red area, equals the natural log of 2. Well, what about this area right here? What if we went from negative 1 to negative 2? Well, this is an odd function, so they're symmetric with respect to the origin. So this area should also be the natural log of 2, but because it falls below the x-axis, it would give me negative natural log of 2. So therefore, we can conclude that if we were to integrate negative uh, 2, because we go left to right, negative 1, 1 over x dx, it should give us negative natural log of 2. But if I use this template, and if I do negative 2 to negative 1, 1 over x dx, and I get the natural log of x between negative 2 and negative 1, and then I stick in the natural log of negative 1 minus the natural log of negative 2. These are both errors. It does not exist. Negative 1 and negative 2 are not in the domain of the natural log, so we can't do this. Unless we throw on that little additive that I told you. If I call this the natural log of the absolute value of x, and then I go from negative 2 to negative 1. It will be the natural log of the absolute value of negative 1 minus the natural log of the absolute value of negative 2. Which in turn is the natural log of 1 minus the absolute value of negative 2, natural log of 2, which is 0 minus the natural log of 2, which is the negative natural log of 2. So that gives us the desired result. So I said, well, you can't always just throw on absolute values to change the sign. So how can I show this algebraically? All right, so let's use substitution to show. We can use substitution and the definition of the absolute value of x, which is it's x if x is greater than or equal to 0. And it's the opposite of x if x is less than 0 to show the integral of 1 over x dx is equal to the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. All right, so by definition, the absolute value of x is itself if the number is non-negative, and it's the opposite of itself if x is negative. That's formally what the definition is. So, if x is greater than 0, then the integral of 1 over x dx is equal to the natural log of x plus c, right? Since the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x, and here x has to be greater than 0 because that's the domain of the natural log. All right, so what happens if x is less than 0? Well, we can do this because if x is less than 0, we're just looking for area in this third quadrant. So algebraically, using calculus, this should be possible. Well, if x is less than 0, let u equal the opposite of x, then du is ne negative dx, right? So in other words, negative du is equal to positive dx, right? So bear with me. So now if we integrate 1 over x dx, I'm going to integrate, oh here, u is negative u is equal to positive x, right? That's what I'm going to do. So then this is really, I'm going to replace this with negative u, and I'm going to replace dx with negative du. So really what I'm integrating is 1 over negative u times negative du. 
but one over negative u times negative du is just one over u du. And if x is less than zero, then u is the opposite of x, so it must, must be positive. So this is just the natural log of u, which is, therefore, if x is less than zero, then one over x dx is equal to the natural log of u, which is the negative x plus c. Does that make sense? So here we have, if x is positive, the integral of one over x dx is equal to the natural log of x itself plus c. If x is negative, one over x dx is equal to the natural log of the opposite of x plus c. But the absolute value of x is equal to x if x is greater than zero, negative x if x is less than zero. So put this all together. The integral of one over x dx is equal to the natural log, the absolute value of x, because it'll be negative x for this piece, it'll be positive x for that piece, plus c. So from this point forward, we want to include those absolute value bars. And that's the proof that one over x dx is equal to natural log of x plus c for any value of x other than zero. All right, a couple more problems and I'll let you go. All right, y cubed three minus y to the fourth to the three sevenths. All right, integrating something to the three sevenths. So my eyes are focusing on what's inside the parentheses, what's being raised to the three power three-sevenths power. So let's let u equal three minus y to the fourth. Then du is, well, that's zero. That's going to be negative four y cubed dy. Now x is here. We have dy's now, right? But I only have y cubed dy left. So this negative four needs to come over to the other side. So negative one-fourth du will replace the y cubed dy. So really what I'm integrating is, now notice I'm not rewriting it. These two are gonna be put together. So I'm just, I'm gonna replace three minus four y with u to the three sevenths. And then what's left is y cubed dy, which I'll replace with negative one fourth du. I'm going to pull this constant factor out front and deal with it later. All right, don't let power functions trip you up too much. U to the three sevenths is a power function. We can add one to the power and then multiply by the reciprocal of the power out front. So this negative one fourth is just going along for the ride. U, my new powers add one, which would be seven sevenths, so 10 sevenths. Put the reciprocal power out front, because notice if, ah, seven tenths, I said it, but I didn't write it. So if I bring the 10 sevenths out front, it cancels with the seven tenths, giving me that coefficient of one in the new power, plus C. So now I'm gonna multiply these two together. I get negative seven over 40 U to the 10 sevenths plus C. All right, so therefore, now let's put it all together. The integral of Y cubed, three minus Y to the fourth, to the 3 sevenths dy is equal to the negative 7 fortieths u, which we call 3 minus y to the fourth, to the new power 10 sevenths plus c. A couple more, we're gonna keep going because like I said, the more you do, the better you get at these. If you're tired, uh, feel free to fast forward to the definite integral stuff kind of hang out and listen. You might learn something. All right, sine of x times the sine of the cosine of x. So be really careful. This is not the sine of x. It's the sine of the cosine of x. There's no x here. So this is the composition of functions. The cosine of x is inside the sine. So this is just the sine of x times the sine of the cosine of x. So I clearly see an inside function here. 
my function inside another function is the cosine. So sometimes you pick something for substitution and it doesn't work, but we're going to try this because that's my gut is telling me that the inside function is the cosine because the cosine of x is inside the sine function. Then du is equal to the derivative of the cosine. Don't forget the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine. So I'm going to replace this with u. So then I'll have the sine of u. What's left is sine x dx. I have negative sine x dx. So I need to get rid of that negative sign. I'll bring the negative over to the left and I'll replace the sine x dx with negative du. So really what I'm integrating is the sine, this sine right here. And instead of the cosine, I'm gonna replace that with u. And then sine x dx is getting replaced with negative du. Bring that negative out front because that's equivalent to multiplying by negative one, sine u du. Okay. And the antiderivative of the sine, what function's derivative is the sine? Well, it's the negative cosine. So that negative just goes down for the ride. The antiderivative of the sine is the negative cosine. So those negatives negate each other and we just get the cosine of u plus c. So therefore, the antiderivative of the sine of x times the sine of the cosine of x dx is just equal to the cosine of u, which is the cosine. So it's the cosine of the cosine plus c. Check, take the derivative. Is it what we started with? We're gonna check this one just for practice. Let's check. The derivative of the cosine of the cosine of x is equal to, well, cosine x is the inside function, so we take the derivative of the outside function, which is the negative sine of Whatever is inside, leave what's inside alone. So the derivative of the cosine of something is the negative sine of that same thing times the derivative of what's inside. The derivative of the cosine is the negative sine of x. And the negative and the negative cancel. We get sine of the cosine times the sine of x. And that is what we started with. Just we can rearrange in which we multiply the sine of x times the sine of the cosine of x. All right, lots of practice. You, If you were moving on to Calc 2, you so want to be good at taking derivatives and antiderivatives, okay? All right, I think I have just a couple more problems here for you. All right, this one seems pretty self-explanatory. We're gonna let u be what's inside. So we're integrating x times 2x minus eight to the fifth power, so let's let u be 2x minus 8, then du is just, well, the derivative of 2x minus 8 is just 2dx. Interesting. If I let that be u, hmm, let's see. I'm going to rearrange this 2x minus 8 to the fifth, and then I have x dx. Right, so this is going to become my u. I only have 2 here. I need x dx. All right, so now the good point in time to say what you can and can't do. You can you can mess around here with constant coefficients. So I can bring let, uh, numerical values back and forth on the left and the right here. You may not throw an additional x out here to call this x dx. X's and u's can't touch. They cannot appear in the same problem. So we do have a slight problem here because I get from here that one half du is equal to dx, so I can replace this with one half du, but then this guy is left over. What do I do with this? All right, well, sometimes we have to be a little sneaky here. Notice if u is equal to two x minus eight, right here, if u is two x minus eight, and then isn't it true that u plus eight is equal to two x, or, u plus eight over two is equal to x. So can I replace this with u plus eight over two? Yes, you can. So what we are actually integrating is, watch how cool this works out. 
u to the fifth, because I replaced 2x minus 8 with u, so it's u to the fifth, times now x. We couldn't get rid of the x dx down here in this part, but I can go back up here and I can solve for x very simply because u is just a linear function. So x is equivalent to u plus 8 over 2, and then dx I'm replacing with 1 half du. might look really tricky, but it's not. This is just, now let's do the algebra. u to the fifth times u plus eight. So I'm going to just call this u to the sixth plus eight u to the fifth. I'm just multiplying right across times one, all over one times two times two is four du. Now I'm gonna pull out this constant, a four in the denominator is equivalent to the coefficient of one fourth out front, u to the sixth plus eight u to the fifth. Do you? And now look, we are integrating a very simple power function. These are one of my favorite problems. I think these are so super cool. All right, so now let's integrate this. This one fourth is just gonna go along for the ride. So I'm just gonna cover it. So the antiderivative, the integral of u to the sixth is u to the seventh with one over seven, one seventh out front. Plus this will be, oh, we have an eight here. We could take the eight out, but I'm just gonna leave it here. I'm gonna do, u to the sixth times one sixth plus c dangling on the end. Now let's clean this all up. One fourth times one seventh is one twenty eighth u to the seventh plus eight over six times four is going to be, well, I think it comes out to be, let me say eight over four is two, two over six is gonna be one third u to the sixth plus c. So now we're going to go back and we're going to, um, Plug this all back in and we get my answer to be. X, 2X minus eight to the fifth, DX to be 128. U, if you go back up to the top, was 2X minus eight. Now it's gonna to be to the seventh power plus one third what we called u, 2x minus eight to the sixth power. Let's see. Let's see. There you go. Go back and check. So the trick was way up here in the beginning. Remember, everything that's in terms of x has to be replaced with something in terms of u. You may not have x's and u's inside the same integral and then integrate. All right, so everything we've done so far has been an indefinite integral. I'm gonna do two examples of definite integrals. I do do these slightly differently based on experience and mistakes that I see students have made. So what I do is first keep in mind when we're integrating and our integration variable is x, then this means x ranges from pi over four to x ranging to pi over two, right? When we change it to u, just because x bounces between these two values, you may or may not. So what I do is I treat this as a definite integral. This definite integral as an indefinite integral. And I say, okay, um, I can let u be either, in either case here, if I let u be the sine, its derivative is the cosine, so that's perfect. If I let u be the cosine, then the derivative is the negative sign, so I'll have to mess with negative signs. You'll get the same answer in the end, but I'm gonna let u be the sine of x, because if I let u be the sine of x, then the du is just cosine x dx, and look how beautifully that all plays out. So I'm really just integrating. This is gonna get replaced with u and what's left is just du. I'm just integrating u du. See how nice and easy that turned out? So right for the time being, I'm, in, I'm not using my integration limits. If I put pi over four here and pi over two here, it would not be correct because x goes from pi over four to pi over two. U would go in, well, if x is pi over four, u would be the square root of two over two. And if x was pi over two, u would be one. So then we could integrate from square root of two over two to one, but I find that students make so many mistakes with that that I say, you know what, just don't bother doing it. Treat it as an indefinite integral. The antiderivative of u is one half u squared, right? <coughs> I'm not gonna put the plus c because it is a definite integral. 
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to now rewrite this in terms of x, one half in u, I call the sine of x squared, and I'm not gonna do the plus c. Now I'm gonna tag on my limits of integration. So I do all this and treat it as an indefinite integral at the very end, once I replace u back with x's, then I'm going to throw on this notation. So this is one half times the sine of pi over two minus one half, oops, squared, don't forget that, the sine of pi over four squared. And now we have to evaluate this. The sine of pi over two is one. So it's one squared times one half, that's just one half, right? And then pi over four, the sine of pi over four is the square root of two over two. So that's going to be minus one half. Now the square root of two over two squared is two fourths. because the square root of two squared is two, two squared is four. And we're just gonna clean this up. This is one half minus one fourth. So the value of this definite integral would be one fourth. So remember, if you have integration limits, your final answer must be numeric. Right, one more, then I'm gonna let you go and play with these on your own. The better you are at these before you start Calc 2, the stronger you are going to start Calc 2. Trust me. All summer long, practice integration, sep uh, integration and differentiation, especially substitution. All right, natural logs. Often in substitution, we're going to let u be the natural log because the derivative of the natural log is 1 over x. There's not too many functions whose derivative is the natural log or we get the natural log in the derivative. So here, um, I'm going to treat this as, again, an indefinite integral. I'm going to say the natural log of x, and notice that's inside the cubic function over x dx. Let's let u be the natural log of x, du will be 1 over x dx, which we have right here because this is just, don't forget what this means, algebraically this is just the natural log cubed, natural log of x cubed times one over x dx, so dividing by x is the same as multiplying by one over x. So right here this becomes u cubed and this just becomes your du. So really what we're integrating is u cubed du, super easy to integrate. Add one to the power and multiply by the reciprocal power or divide by the power four. Dividing by four is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So I'm not gonna add the plus C because this is a definite integral. So I'm now gonna go back and I'm gonna put U to the fourth, which is the natural U is a natural log of X to the fourth power, right? And I'm gonna evaluate that from one to E. One fourth the natural log of e to the fourth power minus one fourth times the natural log of one to the fourth power. All right, so now let's see what you remember from your algebra days. What's the natural log of e? Yep, one. What's the natural log of one? Excellent, zero. So one to the fourth is one, so this is one fourth times one minus one fourth times zero. All right, just a coincidence that two problems in a row were both one-fourth. Not all definite integrals give answers of one-fourth. All right, your job, work on these problems. The more you do, the better you will get at it. This is our next to the last section. We have only one more section to cover. You only have to listen to me one more time. So to do, read 5.5 exercises. Remember, your final exam is going to weigh heavily on integration and differentiation. 1 to 47 odd, 53 to 59 odd. And then X, Y, Z, whatever those corresponding sections are. I don't remember, so you'll have to check. Let's see, did I do it in here? X, Y, Z. I think all your chapter XYZ, chapter five homework is due next week. So get working on that. We will have one more little bonus lecture on integrating um, 
logs and exponents and just some extra problems that will help get you through those last couple sections in XYZ. All right, kids, have a great day. Talk to you later.